Hello everyone. Welcome to At Home Sunday School for Jackson United Methodist Church. And my name is Lucia Fletcher. I teach from the Adult Bible Studies lesson and Hope is the name of the series for this winter. The authors of the lesson are Taylor Mills and Bruce Batchelor Glader. And what I do is try to interpret it to the best of my ability, which is lacking today, and to try to uh, share some of the thoughts. This is one of those lessons where I really wish that we were meeting together because I have a feeling some of y'all could really help me to, to do a better job with this lesson and, and understand it better. But once I read it and I've been contemplating it, I decided what I might do the best is just start teaching it and then see where it goes from there. So I wrote down the words complicated. I don't know if it is, but it seemed like it to me. Complicated. Um, so we'll, we'll just jump in with the lesson. The name of it is dealing with one another and we know that can be complicated don't we dealing with one another the lesson today uh, comes from the book of james and it's chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. these are some of the notes i wrote down about it don't sh um, difficult lesson has not helped me a lot that means what the author was writing uh, these words don't show, show partiality, but God did show partiality. And God has his favorites. And sometimes those favorites are the most needy people. We'll go. We'll go on. The uh, chapter, uh, James 2, 1 through 13. My brothers and sisters whom... When you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected in glory. Imagine two people coming into your meeting. One has a gold ring and fine clothes, while the other is poor, dressed in filthy rags. Then suppose that you were to take special notice of the one wearing fine clothes saying, here's an excellent place, sit here. But to the poor person you say, stand over there, here, sit at my feet. Wouldn't you have shown favoritism among yourselves and become evil-minded judges? My dear brothers and sisters, listen. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Don't the wealthy make life difficult for you? Aren't they the ones who drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who insult the good name spoken over you at your baptism? You do well when you really fulfill the royal law found in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. But when you show favoritism, you are committing a sin. And by that same law, you are exposed as a lawbreaker. Anyone who tries to keep all the law but fails at one point is guilty of failing to keep all of it. The one who says don't commit adultery also said don't commit murder. So if you don't commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you are a lawbreaker. In every way, then speak and act as people who will be judged in the law of freedom. There will be no mercy in judgment for anyone who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy overrules judgment. And actually, those last two verses, 12 and 13, are the ones that kind of come back around to me as to maybe what this is really all about. And I'm going to read them again. 
in every way then speak and act who will, as people who will be judged by the law of freedom. There will be no mercy in judgment for anyone who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy overrules judgment. Well, the author starts by talking about how uh, society has changed in the past, I'm, I'm going to even say a few decades. Um, he talks about how, uh, as a little boy, when his family would fly somewhere, they always dressed up and tried to look their best. Uh, I can remember uh, when my sister and I were uh, really not very old, maybe... Uh, not even early teens or, or early teens, I can't remember the exact year, but we would ride the bus from Jackson. It was a Greyhound bus that would go to Atlanta. We, My parents would let us ride the bus, and I can remember that we had to wear gloves. Now, am I making that memory up or not? I know riding the bus without them, I haven't made that up, but I can remember being dressed up in a frilly dress and wearing gloves, and in that silly, the whole thing is silly. Uh, today in today's standards anyway uh, one Sunday we had a preacher who uh, it was his first Sunday and I think he was going to try to uh, kind of shock us and he did he came to church he had on his robe but then during the church what we found out was that he also was wearing shorts under his robe and uh, there were some people that were a little taken aback by that that he had on you know, shorts uh, instead of his uh, required suit and tie. Times have changed for sure about how we dress for church. And isn't that a blessing? I think so anyway. Um, he says that uh, church has changed a lot too with the uh, coming of more popular uh, services that are less stru structured, let's say, and the music is, is, is different. And um, some of it's been hard to accept and some of it I've been glad to accept and some of it I've realized I should have accepted it easily from the beginning. Some of y'all may be struggling at that and some of the younger people, I know they, again, this is something they have no idea that you had to dress, uh, dress up to go to church. And it was a requirement. It's not a requirement anymore. We still have people that like to, and I think that's great, but, but you don't have to. We, still, we have people that come to church in shorts. We have people that come to, to church in uh, very casual clothes. That's changed. I underlined this sentence. What should a Christian do if someone comes to the meeting in fine clothes and a gold ring. And as far as James was considered, he said, will the Christian seat him in a place of excellence? Then he said, second, what should the Christian do if someone comes to church in filthy rags? Should that person be seated in a low place in the, the way a servant would sit at a master's feet? And then he said, absolutely not. James says uh, his point, or the author says, his point is that if the Christians are giving preferential treatment to the rich, then they are no better than the corrupt judges at that time. In what ways, this is a question the author asks, in what ways do you treat people different based on how they look or what they wear? We can all answer that question for, for ourselves. Um, the second point then moves on from that one that I think is pretty easy for us to, to comprehend and understand is that how maybe we do judge people too much on how they look and what they wear. But then he, wor he goes on to this and I does line this sentence and this is called in a section he called how to act james is saying that god actually shows partiality he condemns christians for giving special treatment to the rich worshiper but he also advocates for special treatment for the poor worshiper who comes into their meeting 
God has chosen the poor to inherit the kingdom, James says. And because God has shown them partiality, Christians should too. Well, all right, I think we can understand that point. That um, our judgment of people should be based on something so much more than appearance. And then he says that uh, this, the author was a preacher, and he said that one, this happened to him one day. He said, one day a well-regarded member of our congregation disappointed me when he said, I love seeing all these new people come to our church, but they don't have any money. What we really need is some wealthier new members. And he said James would be upset with that idea. He saw the rich acting in ways that made life difficult for Christians. And uh, the author goes on to explain that at this time in, in history with the Romans, the, actually the government didn't take people to court. It was individuals that took people to court. And so a lot of times the judges were corrupt because they could be bought off by the most wealthy and, and often was. So it was easy for the rich to burden the poor by dragging them into court. He then goes on, uh, and I underline this uh, sentence from the, that uh, James says the poor are blessed. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? And we can think of several, I think, uh, Bible stories about the rich not being able to understand Jesus and follow Jesus because they're, what made them rich is what became more important to them than their life. And... Um, I think y'all know some of those verses. And then he said, he was talking about the ways that the world of James was different from ours. And um, one of the main ways was that there wasn't a middle class very much. There were, you were either well to do or you were poor. And there wasn't a sort of even a ladder up to becoming a middle class person at the time. So then he says, how do we help? When we are honest with ourselves, can we admit that the rich and the poor are treated differently, even in our churches? And how should we treat people? He then says something that I think makes sense. Uh, if a poor person comes into, uh, obviously by their dress, maybe comes into your church, you just rush them down the aisle and have them sit in the front seat and make a big to-do over them? Or is it better just to treat everybody the same when they came, come in and not point them out for one way or the other? And helping people, he says, is complicated. And how do you help them without hurting them at the same time? How do you help poor people without hurting them? That's something we struggle with in our churches, I believe. So, the last sentence, two sentences I underlined. This starts with seeing the image of God in all people, regardless of their appearance, and treating them the same way that Jesus would. For Jesus' followers have a special concern for the poor, the vulnerable, and the inconvenient persons. That struck me, inconvenient persons. Well, I think y'all can tell I'm struggling with this lesson to make it meaningful, but I hope it, it was in some ways. Next Sunday, February 14th, we'll move on, and I hope to see you then. I want to end this lesson with the author's prayer. Mary said, With all my heart I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. 
He has come to the aid of the servant Israel, remembering his mercy, just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. See you next Sunday.